on Central. He sends a special no, no, email. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you guys, uh, let's start. Let's start. Uh, we're a little bit started, a little bit late, ten minutes or so. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you should this time. So I'm uh, really happy to be here today to present the second lecture in the Ambedkar lecture series by Boston Study Group, and I'm also really happy that the second speaker is also a really powerful Dalit woman, like uh, Miss Manjula Pradeep. Last time, now we have uh, Sangapalli. So, to say a few words about Sangapalli, um, I've known her for the past two years, maybe, but I really feel like I've known her my whole life. Um, but um, so she's doing her PhD in linguistics at JNU, and her area of study is neuro linguistic programming. And she has been involved. She got started in the activism work. Um, beginning with the, you know, uh, in protests and activism against uh, violence uh, perpetrated on the uh, Dalit Adivasi Bangjun women. Um, and she eventually became a very core cool member of Dalit Women Fight campaigns, both in India and also she was here last year for the North American tour. Since then, she's always, she's really been busy. She's been in the forefront of um, all the major struggles we've seen in the past year. Um, she's worked very closely with the Justice for uh, Rohit uh, movement and leadership. And she has um, been been at the protests, not just protesting and you know making her um, making her call for justice for Rohit known, but also documenting um, events as they happen, documenting um, uh, people on the streets, people being beat by police. So some of her uh, videos were very core to showing how Delhi police were very uh, violent against protesters in Hyderabad and so on. Um, and recently, she's also been at UNA, so she's she's really um, you know she's really where makes her presence count where she is. And um, for me, like just seeing her is I just have like so much admiration for her because for me, you know, she represents how Dalit women will be given their autonomy, given um, uh, space in movements, uh, you know, albeit there are problems and things. But I really feel like she's very resilient and she approaches very challenging situations with so much kindness and compassion and just grace. And I really love that about her. So I'm, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll give the floor to her, but just uh, so thrilled. So Jamie, my brother. Uh, thank you, V, and thank you all. Jai Bhim. Jai Bhim. Okay. So, um, first of all, as she said, I'm not actually an activist. I'm mostly in these protests in a different role, in different moments here. And uh, as an activist, I would say that in the last uh, couple of years, I begin my activism with education <coughs> because uh, my area is uh, neuro linguistic programming. As she said, it's neuro linguistic programming means how your patterns, you know, language and your behavioral patterns, your uh, language patterns affect not only your behavior but others' behavior. So um, I, I was very much interested in educating the uh, Dalit students and young youth of Dalit and you know uh, women especially. But um, my activism started with one of the um, moments that happened in Delhi during my JNU um, uh, time, I can say. I'm not a student, a formal student of JNU anymore because I just got deregistered because of various aspects of the same activism play, playing a role in the academics, actually. So um, it began in 2013. Before that, I had known only about a uh, few names in the Dalits uh, movement, like Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And after moving to Mumbai, I came to know about, uh, first time about Savitri Bhai Phule. I mean, she is not a Dalit, she is a Bahujan. But before moving to Mumbai, even like, you know, being in Hyderabad or being in Bangalore, being in Andhra Pradesh, I had never come across this name, Phule or Savitri Bai Phule, in any of our educational, you know, books or textbooks or history books or any kind of, you know, other books as such. 
So this particular case, uh, I would like to start this discourse not with a general perspective, but then the uh, various moments I have been part of. Starting from the Jim case. Jim case is a case where a girl was raped, murdered, and she went through three autopsies and uh, still she is, I mean, her parents are fighting for justice. Her case is now in high court. I mean, it has been moved to high court. That moment onwards, I went on to see the Bagana protest. You all might be knowing about the four girls who were gang raped. And then we have this Dalit Mahila Swabhiman Yatra, Dalit Women Fight, which was actually led by a group of Dalit women at the national level in India, and they moved on to do a North American tour here last year. And then comes the uh, JN, uh, HCU protests for uh, Justice for Rohit, and then goes on to BAPSA. BAPSA, you all know, it's Birsa Ambedkar Foolish Students Association. It's a new organization that was formed in JNU in 2014. It claims to be one of the first Dalit Bahujan platforms for uh, in the electoral, like as an electoral body, because we never had a Dalit Bahujan platform. It was mostly dominated by the left liberal groups, all the left groups like ISA, SFI, AISF, and a lot more, DSU, DSF. There are many, many, many uh, left parties on campus. And the recent uh, UNA, Chalo UNA. So, um, my topic for today is the uh, Dalit women's role in moment building. What exactly is moment building? What do we really need for moment building? People, People and? Cause. Cause, okay, and? Collaboration. Collaboration, yes. Anything else? Same ideology. Same ideology, good, and? Resources. Resources. The one thing that is missing is leader. <laughs> okay, so a lot of movements we have seen that there is a leader. And we look look forward to a leader who can lead the people. That is what is happening. If you see Chalo Una, you can see the face of Jignesh Mevani. If you see uh, Justice for Rohit Vemula, Radhika Amma is there. If you see um, Dalit Mahila Swapi Maniatra, Asha is there, Manisha is there. There are leaders and there are people who follow them. But what exactly makes a movement successful? Because we have seen lots of movements and we keep saying that, you know, uh, Ambedkar movement is okay. good, left movement is really good. And, uh, you know, a lot of movements we have seen, we would say that these are you know, powerful, these, these are strategical, they are, these are making effective, you know, uh, moves in the society, change, bringing change. But then what is exactly a successful moment? Can anyone tell me? When can we say that the moment has been successful? When the change is made. Right? Okay. If you're able to mobilize the large number of people, including the Groups, then to the okay. Hey. Anything else? Well, I know because I don't want to give a lecture. I want to have an interactive session. Well, with the aim of the movement of achieved, then one can say. Successful. Right. Okay. So there are various aspects of uh, how we look at a moment, whether it is successful or not. At the same time, there are other aspects of whether the moment is able to establish itself in all spaces and also in, is inclusive. For example, when we talk about Dalit women, how many Dalit women leaders do you know in these moments? Leading the movement, not as a participant. Mayavati. Mayavati. Okay, one. Anybody else? Kotal, okay, yes. Anybody else? You. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so when we see in a in a in a in a broad perspective, it's only Mayavati because that is she is known to the whole world. And if you look beyond Mayavati, maybe one can talk about Fulan Devi before that. One can talk about um Jalkaribai. Yeah, we all know about Jhalkari Bai, right? Mm -hmm. How many of you know about Jhalkari Bai? Okay, good. So we know Jhalkari Bai, we know 
Fulan Devi, we know Bahanji Mayavati. These are the three major faces that we have seen, you know, in our maybe uh, during school days or maybe politically aware people might be knowing about these faces. But then, ha have you ever heard of Anna Minambal Simraj? No, not even a single person in this room. Okay. She happens to be the first women president of South India Scheduled Caste Federation. During uh, Baba Saheb, I mean, during the movement he started, and in 1920, <coughs> when he came up with Moknaik, he also started this women's federation, it was led by all women. So there were these names which come up later, like Anai Minambal Sivraj, Sulochna Bai Dungre, and then we have Jai Bhai Chaudhary. These are all not just faces which were there in the protests or would come and sit and listen to Baba Sahib and go. They were the ones who started schools. They were the ones who started hostels. They were the ones who presided over large conferences where more than 25,000 women would participate. And even in today's day, if we see 25,000 Dalit women gathering at one place is going to be something miraculous. No, it, it never happens because even in Dalit women fight, we have hardly had 3,000 to 4,000 women, but 25,000 women in that period it happened, but it's not happening now. Why? Why is that the moment could not go ahead and bring in more Dalit women? Because today we are like 50% of 260 million of Dalit population, right? So we should be in a position to bring more Dalit women to any conference and also be able to easily bring them, mobilize them. As I said, movement has to mobilize people, right? And it's not happening. Why is this failure? So these so when are- When was this 45,000 women gathered? Can you tell a little bit more about it? Uh, I, I can give you the date. Maybe we can find out more in the writings and speeches. It's okay. in 1942. In uh, July 20, on July twentieth, oh, no, probably in Nagpur, yeah, and there was one in Pune in nineteen thirty, and in nineteen I mean during nineteen fifties in Madras. So there were like many conferences. It was not just one. So Sulochana Bai Dongri presided over one conference, and Anna uh, Minambal presided over in one more, and Jaya Chaudhary was in another one. So there are many more. Actually, these women. Uh, I think this particular book called We Also Made History, We Too Made History. <laughs> Does anyone know about it? Yeah. We Too Made History. Actually, that quotes all these names of the women leaders who were part of Ambedkarite movement. Because even today, the media doesn't want to report. So you would, we can just even guess how it would have been at that time. Is this somewhere, whatever the limited information you have, a document of the web or somewhere. You know, Some people very, have tried and they have created their own blogs yeah. and then they have published it. Yeah, yeah. Some of these people are on the lit history on the camera. Yes, rather, rather, yeah. That's but, true. but really, the first time I heard any of these names was in that book that you mentioned. We Too Made, we too made History. history yeah. And we also have many Dalit women who have written their biographies, autobiographies. Mm -hmm. And that too, not recently, but then in 1948, we come up, uh, who's that person? Shantabai, Shantabai Kamble, Baby Tai Kamble. And then we have in uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Obama. So there are many women, but they are not quoted anywhere in the mainstream literature. So Dalit feminism, Dalit literature doesn't show Dalit women even. Even Dalit literature, I would say that because very few, like you know, even if if we look at some of the uh, poetry today, we can see Gogo Shyamala, the recent entries, I can say, not the previous ones. They're so, more like writers. <coughs> yeah. They're not, they're not mobilizing. Them. No, they're that is what I'm talking yeah, about the, literature, Dalit literature yeah, yeah. and literature, poetry. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Well, one question. Uh, so, uh, Ishwari Bai, you know, the Bai. Ishwari Bai. Okay, she was the RTI uh, woman legislator and very vibrant Dalit woman at that time. Okay. First 
Dalit uh, legislator. You know Gita already? Gita now, Bai. No, no, no. Now, Gita already now. Yeah, that used to be minister. And now she became ready, but her mom is Yes, Bai. I know, I know, I know. She was uh, pretty close to work with our uh, Baba Sahib and, you know. So her father. Connect. No, no, each one is Bai. No, Gita Reddy. Gita Reddy is mother. So yeah. yeah. Let's not talk about Gita Reddy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, each one is Bai. Uh, so maybe she was. Uh, she was one of them. Was, actually, so I, I went through that. Too. I just yeah, gave there's a few no other names Dalit here. Woman leader in Andhra Pradesh, but I, I, I come from Andhra. Yeah, so, yeah so I'm from Andhra, so yeah. I know too that yeah. there are no Dalit women leaders there. Yeah, I mean, the only one I can think about and now is no one else. So these are the women I was talking about, but then there are more actually. <coughs> this is one. Uh, Activist, I would say she was in the Constituent Assembly of India, Dakshini. She comes from Kerala. So, this is the gin protest I was talking about, which I was part of in 2013. And this was where I understood what exactly is violence against Dalit women and how it is being perpetrated, how it is taken by the judiciary, how the uh, you know, a doctor's. Uh, respond to the cases and even the state response to these cases i would just give you a small example of this case where as i said the girl had to undergo three autopsies it was like protest after protest the activists would take her from one place to another place to get the autopsy done because every autopsy was a failure it would just say that it was a suicide but whereas the people who saw her the activists who saw her, saw her with blood marks on her body and cigarette marks on her body. So they very well knew that this was a rape case. Her clothes were here and there. And then the first thing, the SP, you know, the superintendent of police, notices about the body when she's taken to the hospital is that it's a clear cut case of suicide. Why do you even need post-mortem? Mm -hmm. That's it. And then for hours and hours, the parents wait, the relatives wait, and when they don't do the autopsy, they go to the bus terminal to protest where the father is kicked, the body, the dead body is kicked by the police. And when that comes in the news, repeatedly telecasted, that is when there is a lot of pressure mounted on the administration, and then they take up the case and then do the postmortem. So, this is just a small example. The father does not get the autopsy report even after five months. After RTI, only he gets the you know uh, report. And then finally, even at the last you know uh, in the last autopsy in Ames, they reported as a suicide case and it was closed. So this protest was mostly led by women. If you can see. Here you can see women. Here you can see women. It's not because it was a violence against women that they are fighting for, but we have seen these protests happening. Whether it was Occupy UGC, which was for the uh, which was for the um, uh, fellowships, which were uh, not being given to the students, and they were about to uh, take away all these fellowships. Like you know, we have these UGC fellowships, which is like five thousand rupees per month. I think that's almost like how, how many dollars? Hundred dollars, not even hundred. Yeah. <clears throat> so a student survives on this five thousand rupees per month. That was taken away from the those students who mostly come from marginalized classes and then very deprived classes to JNU or and these this is not given to all the universities. Universities it is only to the. Uh, you know, central universities actually the um, what we say this <coughs> district level or state level universities don't get these uh, funds. So even these funds were not being given to the students. So even when we fought for that, we had women in the leading role, but not the Dalit women. Okay, because somewhere Dalit women keep missing every time. Mm -hmm. These are the Bagana protests. Bagana was uh, Bagana is a place from, uh, in Haryana where four girls, four Dalit girls, were uh, gang raped, and they kept protesting for almost a year. The girls were sitting in Jantar Mantar, even during winters, summers, and rainy monsoons, and then 
recently they moved to Hisar, but then they don't have a place to stay. They are still protesting in front of the mini secretariat there. But if you see these photographs here, this is a protest in front of the Haryana Bhavan. At that time, it was Congress government, not the BJP. You can see all the women so charged up, actually. I remember at this protest, there were lots of big names who came to protest. And then they were all there. The media was there. And uh, the media reported the uh, event and uh, took some interviews. And after that, when the time came to go protest, break the barricades, all the big names disappeared. Because interviews got over, media was not there anymore. So these women were the ones because they want justice. They want to fight. They want to give justice to not just their families, but then all the families who are fighting for justice across the country. Who actually fought and then broke the barricades that day. I have more videos of this. Maybe if I get time next time, I can show you. But then see you can see that small girl who is questioning the police so where does this courage come from it's is it courage or is it pain is it suffering is it what exactly why do these people come to the forefront to fight it's not just that you want leadership they don't want leadership they are not craving for leadership they are not craving for limelight they are not craving for any interviews they know what exactly the pain is of violence for ages and ages, these are the ones who are fighting with the landlords, feudal landlords <laughs> at their place. And they have to go back. If they don't fight, they can't survive. They have already lost a lot of people and their families. So when I talk about women leading, especially with the Dalit women, there are young girls who are just sometimes dropouts. Some of these girls they don't go to school even because <laughs> their parents feel that education will spoil the girls. They would want to go out, which they can't afford because sending them to a place called a place like New Delhi is very costly. They can't spend that much money. And as I said, there are no scholarships. There are no hostels in Delhi, no girls hostel. So I'm not talking about general, even SCST hostels are not there. Social welfare hostels are usually there in many major you know, cities like Hyderabad. <coughs> I know Hyderabad has many and then Mumbai has many. But then Delhi, we couldn't find even a single girls hostel for Dalits and Adivasis. So their parents don't want to send them there. So most of these girls are dropouts and they don't go to school anymore. And when these people were approached by the uh, Dalit Mahira Swabhimani Yatra leaders, they wanted to come out. They wanted to make some difference, you know, make, bring some change. And then they fought with their parents. Even today they fight because they know that it's not going to give them any kind of livelihood. It's not for livelihood that they are fighting because they know that if they don't fight, there will be 10 more girls who will be sitting at home and then getting married off at the age of 14, probably having children at the age of 16, and then raising that, them at the, in the same area, same way where they are working for the feudal landlords in the agricultural fields where, where they get raped. And there is no justice. So these girls have a hope in these moments. And when they come out, they just don't come out alone. They bring all these women, they bring their children, they bring their family members. I remember this particular scene where the woman is, I mean, these two women are with children. I was, uh, we were marching. Uh, I was mostly into documentation. So uh, there is one thing that I would like to say is I just keep taking photographs and then keep posting them on social uh, forums like Instagram or probably uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter. And I remember I clicked the photograph because it was like very sunny and then I clicked the photograph and then I wanted to post it and then suddenly I realized the mother was feeding the baby and walking, marching with us. Which actually was so, so, so powerful because why would a mother who is feeding a baby would march with us for 10 kilometers? She doesn't need to. She's not being paid. I mean, nobody is paying her for that. What is it that is 
you know, so, 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 so uh, attractive. Nothing. It's about fight. Nobody wants to fight. Why would they want to fight? They want to sit and then take care of their kids and then have a good life like others have. But it's not the life that they're leading. If they are not in the position where they are today, then there is no <clears throat> movement. As we said, movement, make, movement is of people, movement is of leader, but then movement is also about followers, which is always missing. Because unless and until we have followers who are ready to follow and then be with us, there is no leader. There is no movement. But what happens in all these moments today is there is a leader and the follower is missing somewhere in the crowd. I remember there was one TED talk I was going through recently where he says that there is no leader if the first follower doesn't come through. Because a person wants to make a change, he wants to go ahead, but then if so, nobody wants to encourage him, nobody wants to follow him, then he will not be a leader at all. He's just a lone person who is trying and, you know, stupidly thinking of making a change in the society. Unless and until he has a follower, he cannot be a leader. So today we have leaders, but even this leader has to be a follower. He has to consider, <coughs> nurture each and every follower as equal, which is missing. <coughs> and also, uh, what is very peculiar about Dalit women uh, <coughs> movements are, you have the leader as a <coughs> Dalit woman, you have even the cultural, you know, because all these cultures come from Dalit traditions, drumming or parai or a lot of things. I mean, these cultures actually emerge from the tribal and Dalit traditions. And, you know, every woman who comes from these areas is knows about, you know, how to play parai and how to play drums. I don't know, of course, because I was brought up in a city. Probably that is the main reason. But if you ask, a lot of my friends in JNU, when I saw them, they were able to beat the pariah. I was like, wow, that was so nice. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. <clears throat> but yes, so these were these women were also part of our moments. Justice for Rohit would not have been possible if Rohit's mother did not take the initiative to fight. Because even before Rohit Vemula, there were many suicides that happened in the same institution, Hyderabad Central University, Senthil Kumar, there was Rajesh, so many. Even there was a there was a Dalit woman whose name nobody knows about. I think Lavanya or some Kaushalya. I don't remember even. So, uh, okay, this reminds me of uh, the death of merit. How many of you have seen that documentary? Okay. So Death of Merit talks about 18 suicides, right? Some 18 to 19 suicides. If you have gone through the documentation of the names of these people who committed suicide. Among all those 18, nine are women, actually, Dalit women. But nobody knows their names. Even I don't know. So it's, it's, it's our failure to recognize Dalit women not even as a leader, but not even even after death, we cannot recognize a Dalit woman. That is what happened in the case of Delta. When we see a Delta, <coughs> this is the small girl. I would have never imagined myself at this age to be in front of <coughs> such a big crowd, holding the mic and speaking something. I would have never dared to do that. But this girl coming from a small <coughs> village of Rajasthan, which is like even <coughs> the border of India, it's called Barmer in Bikaner. She has been in the leadership position since her childhood. She gets raped and murdered and nobody talks about it. There were few protests. When there is a moment, like for example, justice for Rohit Remila moment, we could see lots of placards saying justice for Rohit. We want justice for Rohit. We want uh, institutional mur murderers to be punished. And there were women, there were men, there were, they were from all the communities 
you know, coming forward, walking on the streets and demanding justice. Similar thing happened in the case of Nirbhaya, the Delhi bus rape case. But what happened to the case in Jin? What happened to the case in Bagana? What happened to Delta? What happened to Jisha? There are many Dalit women who are in the leadership position. Even Delta, I would say that if she would have given a chance, she would have made much better <coughs> leaders than us today. She was so, so, so powerful, so confident. If she had got the probably a chance to uh, know Facebook, social networking, probably she could have done major, major wonders. But no, she did not get that chance. She was killed. <coughs> Jisha, a lot of people said that she was murdered because there was some personal conflict with a guy. But then it's not the case. She was also fighting for the land rights there. Mm -hmm. She was actually organizing families, which were like 50 families, who were uh, who have occupied that uh, you know uh, barren land. It's like mm -hmm. Borumbukubumi, they say, and. They have been there for almost like 30 years. And then because they were being evacuated, <coughs> she was fighting for that case. And just two weeks before she was murdered, she was at the um, um, office, the district collector's office, to talk about this land, land issue. And then she was killed. And in this case, a migrant worker was <coughs> arrested. And that's it. The case was closed. And even this migrant worker would be somewhere from, you know, northeast. So you know whom to actually criminalize in these Dalit cases. Every Dalit case I have seen, whether it is Jab Kheda or whether it is Kerlanji, whether it is uh, Jin case, whether mm -hmm. it is Bagana case, they have brought some, you know, uh, some of their family members into picture saying that these were the ones who are the culprits and then mm -hmm. close the case. <coughs> This is the Chalo Ona photo, where uh, I remember that many of the moments, as I said, the Dalit women's faces keep missing. Even in the Chalo Ona, the media has been focusing mostly on uh, the only leader, Jignesh Mevani. And the women were missing, 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 missing everywhere. Uh, when Dalit camera went there, they took some interviews of Manisha Mashal. She was part of the Yatra throughout eight days. And then uh, there were a few more women who were you know, captured in the cameras. But then on the final day, when we went there, I saw a huge crowd of women who came there. And when I asked them, what is that? What, what are your demands? They said, we want five acre land. We want our children to get education, uh, not education. We, we want five acre land that will uplift us. I asked them one question. Our fight is for land rights, definitely yes, because 90% of the Dalit families do not have their own land, even the agricultural land. They are working as, you know, even when we talk about peasant movement, you know, it's not for Dalit people. It's for the uh, agricultural landlords. We don't own agricultural land. So we are still fighting for that. But the basic thing is also education. It has to go along with the land rights and then this moment. So when I asked the women, can you see all of these people sitting on the stage? They said, yes. So are they here because of the land or the education? And they said, education, of course. So education is must. And <coughs> any moment, whether it is land rights moment, whether it is present moment, or any moment should actually focus on education. And if we see the literacy rate, all these women, whoever are coming here, they are mostly followers. They are not in the leadership position. You can see in the leadership position, but also they are not the decision makers. Mostly the decision makers are somebody else. Like you see the Panchayat Raj. There are women, uh, Dalit women who are the punts or even the uh, Sarpunts. But then they are not the decision makers. It, it is usually their landlords or the, you know, uh, whatever upper caste people own that area. Even these women have to sit when these people are, you know, uh, I mean, sit down on the floor when they are sitting on chairs. So these are these situations where we, we think that there is a lot of leadership coming up. But then when we look behind, you know, between the lines, we can see that the leadership is really missing. 
and we need to actually bring education a lot of capacity building in women and that is where comes naroti devi she is from rajasthan okay tara devi and naroti devi these two are also <coughs> serpents from uh, rajasthan this lady who you see she is like 70 plus and she is one of the uh, first serpents who went to school learn computers and she actually taught computers to the uh, local officers there because they don't know how to use them and she not only taught them but then now she has grandchildren whom she has taught computers and then she went on for 5 years where people say i mean it has been reported that before she left the position of a serpent there was still 13 lakh rupees in the treasurer account so she actually managed to build roads she managed to build schools but still be genuine enough to you know use the money resources in a proper way <coughs> and then you find this tara devi on the corner mm -hmm. she was she is also a sarpanch who is very well known for you know fighting for uh, dalit women rights especially girl child and krishna veni is from tamil nadu who was also very popular as a sarpanch who took care of you know building roads and hospitals but then she was attacked by upper caste people actually only when she got attacked that is when the news came but otherwise krishna veni was not known to anybody and that too was covered by dalit camera nobody else dalit camera you all know right yeah okay <clears throat> this lady bhavri devi how many of you know about her okay good few hands she is also from rajasthan mm -hmm. she is a dalit activist who was raped gang raped twice while she was working with uh, as a sathin i believe and then uh, she fought and this is the uh, this is the case where the judge actually says you know that you are a dalit woman how can they touch you so yeah. we don't believe that they raped you but she went on to fight and even today she is like she is like a very powerful lady there she is chitralekha from kerala in 2005 she was attacked by uh, the cpi leaders there and then even till date she is fighting but then she has not stopped fighting she is like very brave she takes her auto i mean she is an auto driver first of all we rarely find auto drivers in 2005 it was rare definitely now today maybe we can find few auto drivers in delhi i i don't find anybody very few you can find cab drivers at the most but not auto drivers but in a place like kerala she she uh, used to drive auto and then her auto was burned she was attacked many times even recently she was attacked but still she is fighting okay here comes babsa because i want to end this with uh, not end exactly because there are many more things before babsa i will say probably i'll go ahead with uh, you all know ruth manorama right because uh, when people talk about uh, dalit women movements there are hardly any movements except now that we see all india dalit mahila adhikar manch and uh, nchhr there are few more uh, now surgeon which is led by uh, manchula prati we hardly know any more uh, you know dalit women movements in the past or current uh, current scenario but then as i said there were women who led but then uh, in 1995 there was a special you know uh, national federation of dalit women which was formed basically to uh, have dalit women representation in the beijing conference in 1995 that was the sole reason why they had this formation of dalit federation of dalit oh, sorry national <coughs> federation of dalit women that was the major uh, dalit women movement we can think of post independence pre independence it was all about uh, ambedkar rights movement as we said and the presence of all the women there but as but well as we did not have any autonomous autonomous movement movement but when i say a feminist moment it also as we said we need collaboration we we are ready to accept friendship allies and solidarity from others but we are still in the formation of our own movements 
we are still learning to understand strategize and see what would really help to these moments so an autonomous leadership i mean a leadership where these are the people trying to find out figure out what exactly is to be done what is the need of the time what is that they really want because i remember there was one uh, moment where uh, radhika amma i was there and uh, we went to meet one very big leader and then she kept on telling us what do you want what do you want what do you want tell us we will do it <laughs> i was like okay relax don't do anything right now give us some space we need to think we need mm. to sit we need to really discuss mm. we need to understand what exactly is the scenario like and i stopped her at that time i said do one thing give us time let her think let her talk let her discuss with the group in the meanwhile if you come up with any idea please let us know we will see if it fits into our you know strategy or not and if it doesn't maybe we can talk about it but don't force them don't try to be a part of it saying that i am helping you just tell me what i should do no the way you can help us is probably wait for us and give us some time to think decide and see what we can do and then and then when we say yes we are ready then just come with us and be a part of it the moment have to be like that you can be you can be decision makers in the moment whatever we are thinking of at a later stage but in the beginning it has to be autonomous it has to be those people whether it is tribal moment whether it is dalit moment whether it is muslim moment minority moment or any kind of moment women's moment women's women do not definitely want men to lead it right because men can never understand the perspective of women ever so this autonomous moment that we are talking about which is building slowly but definitely <coughs> is building so uh, ruth manorama is now uh, i think uh, heading the national federation of dalit women and uh, i'm coming to this literacy aspect because today when we see there are a lot of dalit women in higher education i mean <laughs> when i com comparatively i wouldn't say a lot of women because even in my uh, university if i see there are like hardly uh, 40 women probably <clears throat> that's it all across the schools and uh, you know uh, centers so uh, when we look at that figure it was less even 10 years before it was i mean there was no scope of having dalit women in schools in big schools like jnu and hcu but even coming so far have we been identified as equals to other counterparts <coughs> there are like you know i i i i have been to a lot of colleges lot of universities this is my third university that i'm uh, in right now i have not seen any kind of women leadership there i mean dalit women leadership is like completely missing women leadership was like i have not found it in andhra university eflu uh when i was there part of eflu there was no women's movement there and let's say women's movement but not even women's group only now recently we have formed a, a women's group on campus in jnu before that we did not have any women's group as well they would say that we are we are here we are fighting for you why do you need a separate movement as such why do you need a separate group because we are there for you a very brahmanical way of thinking because i am there for you you don't need to get education so uh, this literacy rate uh, i'm talking about because today if you see there are a lot of dalit women in higher education there are women in small small uh, in small small numbers in various areas like media like i i would never see a dalit woman holding a camera and you know running on the streets to shoot something <laughs> till the time i saw pen mori okay i would I, <laughs> i would take pictures when i was in college you know but i was not in the protest you know running and in taking pictures but i ran a lot with pen mori on the buses photos i don't know where all we got into and then you know started shooting so these are the places when i saw that okay women leadership is not necessarily only in these moments but we need to have our presence everywhere 
whether it is media, whether it is academics, whether it is politics, whether it is, uh, you know, because there's four pillars of uh, democracy, we need to be in everything. <clears throat> Only then we can say that, okay, Dalit women have progressed. And uh, 56.50 is the literacy rate of Dalit women, whereas the general women is like 64.6. So it is still lesser than the uh, regular general women. So what we definitely want is the dropouts should go down. Rape case follows with, you know, dropouts, actually. <laughs> there are lots of dropouts in Haryana, lots and lots of dropouts in Haryana. And uh, the literacy of Bihar, <coughs> Pakistan, UP are still less than 25%, even till date. When Dalit women come forward and take leadership, these are the very few people, right, who are coming to higher education. And if we don't acknowledge that leadership, then we are actually not creating an inclusive society. And uh, that, that uh, idea of egalitarian society is our dream for us then. OK, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about was Babsa, where uh, Babsa was formed in 2014. This November, we will turn into like, you know, turn two years old. But then uh, this JNU elections, everyone would have heard about the emergence of Babsa and the uh, presidential debates and everything. This girl whom you see in this video is the president of Babsa. None of the political parties on campus has a women leader. So um, what need of the time today is to have women leaders because as Babas I have said movements can really be successful if women are given the leadership position in that and he also says that I uh, measure any community's progress looking at their women you know how the women are treated in that community so what exactly we are looking forward for is not just talking for uh, Dalit women because there are many moments actually I can when I said there is no Dalit movement it was basically to show the autonomous movements that I'm talking about but if you go anywhere in India there are lots of Dalit movements like Dalit Mahila Samiti, Dalit Mahila Shakti, a lot of things but they are mostly led by upper caste. They are sitting in somewhere in New Delhi or mm -hmm. Bombay mm -hmm. and and if you see, the people who are actually working at the grassroots levels are the women. They are never at the UN, you know, addressing the issue of caste-based violence. Very few, very few. But they are actually working. There are many. Kabar, uh, Kabar Laheria, there is one this, uh, one of the media which is run by, you know, uh, Dalit women and marginalized women. They don't come uh, on any of the mainstream, you know, news. They are so not talked about. Also yeah, but then actually they are un, uh, at the yeah, grassroots level. Yeah. The cupboards come from the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what I'm talking about. So you don't, we don't want someone else to lead our movements. Mm -hmm. We want your solidarity. We want your collaborations. But let us lead our movements. That's it. Thank you. Jebi. <laughs> So, any questions, any uh, clarifications? The house is open. Yes. Um, I mean, I think one of the issues that I, I see is um, you know, what kind of education? Because you're also living in a world where it's class based education. Yeah. So, you know, it's um, very difficult for young children, young women, children to, you know, to go to these schools where what they're being taught is really um, against their whole being. 
Mm. So it's a very difficult, um, you know, so education, I mean, in, in some ways, they, that street education is really actually very important in the sense that the difference that is taking place, but what kind of education becomes really important because you cannot have the education that's existing because it also turns you into something else. Absolutely. And it turns you into a careerist. You've got careers to take care of. And within the systems we have, individualism is the way to go. So you never go back to yeah. your village. You never go, you, you, you move forward in this, uh, in this world in that way. So it's a very problematic of how, you know, what's education? Yeah. So that's my question to you. What is it? Okay. So uh, I was on one of these uh, talks where they talked about Ambedkar at moment and education. I was referring to this particular book in, uh, I think it was in Gujarat. They introduced this uh, book for third class students. It was CBSC, I believe, most probably. And uh, under this, you know, great saints in India, they had named Asaram also. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what, really? Asaram is greatest saint who is actually a rapist? And uh, like, so this. <laughs> Only when people fought, protested, well, they removed it. And as uh, you know, as uh, one of the, uh, I mean, we had started this Dalit History Month because of various reasons that you're talking about. Because the history has been erased completely. Oh, absolutely. Completely. It's yeah. like none of the figures that we talked about today mm -hmm. appears in any mm -hmm. of the history textbooks. So. What kind of education that we are exposed to from the early age, even till you know higher education, is a question mark. Yes, and that is the reason why we need representation of all these communities in various fields, like whether it is the head of the NCRT, whether head of the media. You need to have these representations, and that is why they fight for you know um, what is this reservations? That is, I think, affirmative action here, probably. So. But whenever we talk about mm -hmm. reservation, the question here comes of capability. They feel that only people who are, uh, you know, incapable, incapable, actually need reservation. It's not about it. For ages and ages, we have been deprived of this education, resources, everything. If today we want equality, equality is not about, you know, uh, when they say that okay, ten years, twenty years, you had reservation, just move out of this town now. Everyone wants reservation. Whether you are a feudal landlord, whether you are having lots of uh, you know assets, whether you are having uh, education uh, and money and property, it doesn't matter. They want reservation because we are having reservation. The only problem for them is reservation. But then this is the reservation which has helped us to come till here. If I'm able to even access education, it's because of that. Otherwise, I would still be somewhere, you know working in some small village. My dad could migrate to a small city because of education, because of that small reservation. He went to this uh, Zilla Parishad school, probably Zilla Parishad school is a local, you know, uh, government school. And they give reservation to students from these communities. If we hadn't got this opportunity, then we wouldn't. But then still education needs to be reformed it needs a lot of change but then until and unless we have <coughs> our people tribal people because i remember there was a, a argument saying that your language is very crude abusive yeah. we don't want these textbooks in the schools uh, maybe you have some of you have read jhutan yeah, yeah? jhutan has some few words which has like you know <coughs> some abusive words and when that was introduced to ba level students in igno lot of parents protested against that introduction of the book and they said we don't want our children to learn these abusive words it's not about teaching it's about knowing that how dalit pe dalits are treated it's about knowing the reality mm -hmm. and then uh, miss vimal thorat actually fought for it and then finally she got it into the be mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, syllabus so we need to fight because yeah. our language has, we, we have always been hearing this so this is our literature this is our poetry which has abuses which has everything but these abuses come from you so deal with it yeah so just 
JMU is always portrayed as left-leaning and so-called German builders and stuff. How did you get deregistered? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not because uh, any of these left uh, thing, but then my professor happens to be a BJP lenient person. Mm -hmm. Not my professor, but then the dean. Mm -hmm. And uh, she also doesn't like my topic. Neurolinguistic programming uh, sounds similar to neurolinguistics, which is about brain and uh, language. My study is not about brain and language, but mm -hmm. then it's about mind and language. And she says, I don't want to hear this word. You change the topic. Mm -hmm. I did not, <laughs> I did not <coughs> actually form this word. So I keep telling her that this is something that I'm working on. It's not that I'm endorsing NLP. I'm like trying to find out whether NLP will work in the Indian context because UK in UK all the schools the uh, all the schools teachers are trained before they get into the you know schools so preschool training actually has a syllabus of NLP so I I'm thinking probably it can help in India as well and we have been doing this experiment I think it's only me who has done it in academics there is another person who has done it in the quality something I don't remember but then yes it's a new topic and they don't want to come up with any new topic actually so, so she yeah, stopped my like synopsis so maybe <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah that is also true because I was given only one mark in my viva you know about it, right? That Viva marks will be like usually one to four or five for mm -hmm. Dalit students yeah. usually. Mm -hmm. Though though they are performing really well, the maximum one can get is like you know five marks. Mm -hmm. So they are usually from the beginning discriminated. Yes. You know? So if you're really strong activist, then uh, mm -hmm. some or the other way they will do some nonsense. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned uh, I'm going to sound like the person you described. So what can we do? Working? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So you want to really ask that question to me now? So I think I answered time. that in my <laughs> presentation. But then, yes. Uh, as I said, the movements that are emerging right now, there are many uh, Dalit women who are coming up, you know, raising their voice against uh, Dalit uh, you know, at caste atrocities, caste-based sexual violence, and also um, trying to be, you know, uh, into these fields of which actually have an influence on people like media, social networking and everything. So if we can really support and if you are really interested in, interested in supporting them, maybe you can uh, try to make them, you know, meet with other folks here or anywhere else, connect them to different other folks. And also probably, you know, whenever they feel that they need some help or solidarity, be in touch with them and then create that environment <coughs> where they don't feel that you know, someone is patronizing them because, you know, they are on the upper hand. But then, because I have seen a lot of places where people would come, even Ravish Kumar for that matter, I have seen how he comes and he says that, okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing that for the Dalit people. And a lot of people actually thought Ravish Kumar was a Dalit because he speaks in those terms. When they came to know that he's not a Dalit, then they were like, oh my gosh, really? Why does he say these all things then? You don't need to say that, oh, I'm also a Dalit because I'm facing violence. No, Dalit face violence in a very different way. That's totally different. So understanding that gap, and giving that, you know, um, what we say, respect to that gap is very important. And as I said, this respect is something that we are fighting for. Whether it is in personal life or professional spaces. Yeah. Can you tell us something about um, Pops a little more about what the program is? Um, how they see the role of women. Oh yeah, that's what we have had. Uh, if you have seen, we have a president who yeah. is uh, leading the uh, BAPSA. And then we also had one of the uh, joint secretary candidates who was a Bahujan woman. So we had two Bahujans and two Dalits in this uh, elections where uh, we had really strong voices, we can say, and from different regions. And we are also trying to like you know, uh, focus on uh, Northeast 
in the sense we have got a lot of support from the uh, Gorka community. We have got support from even the um, queer groups across the uh, colleges. So mm -hmm. it's because we are trying to reach out and also because we are the ones who are usually you know, targeted, whether it is queer, mm -hmm. whether it is minority, whether it is Dalit or tribal. So you know when you are targeted and you are in the same position, maybe your locations are different. But still, you are the more affected people in this whole group of you know Indian society. So you can connect with each other <coughs> easily. And we have got support from even Muslim students in this whole uh, thing. That's the reason, if you see, there is not much of the margin, you know, we were like, we got 1500 and they got 1900. And you can see that this was a united left. Two parties getting 1900 and one party, which is like just one year old, getting 1500 votes mm -hmm. for the president. Mm -hmm. So it, if, if, if not, you know, if they wouldn't have united, then you could have known the result mm -hmm. yourself. That's right. But then I somehow feel that there is always a feeling that we are the saviors, we want to do mm -hmm. something. If you really were mm -hmm. wanting to do something for the Dalit minorities and tribals, you could have just easily supported the people who mm -hmm. were emerging as leaders mm -hmm. and voted for them. So there is always this political you know, uh, sphere where there is a fight going on that we want to fight for Dalits, we want to fight for Dalits. And uh, Dalits are never, you know, yeah. seem to come up and then uh, take the leadership that is the problem wherever it is so the moment i can see or anybody can see that the dalit leadership is emerging mm -hmm. and then there is a lot of support from all other spheres then that is the time we can say that this is the real solidarity <coughs> so jnu elections were i would say that that was not the real solidarity mm -hmm. if you see all the panelists in uh, united left there was not a single dalit function it is the presidential candidate is a upper caste. All of them, of course. <coughs> yeah, most. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. want to talk about no, it. Yeah. This uh, issue of uh, uh, you know, the women coming together. It's um, it's actually really important because you know empowerment. Like it has to go through your body. It's not something that's that's just comes there. Outside, and yeah. Just comes in. <laughs> yeah. So that struggle. You know, uh, <coughs> comes, and, and, and that's not just the it, women, it's everything. That until you don't battle through your, you know, being, yeah, um, you don't even know what, you know, what, what struggle, how to fight that struggle. So, like, it's really important to move forward um, on this basis of, um, you know, having that kind of independence. Yeah. And being yeah. able to um, slowly, slowly go through that motion as mm -hmm. a people, but at the same time, you know, as you said, you know, assistance, because you're the ones who are going to be knocked first. So, you know, there's a lot of people who can um, assist in uh, protection. And that's, I mean, I think that is the um, yeah. wonderful way of um, synergy that uh, one can get. But um, I think at this moment, um, you know, the upper caste think, um, you know, some are very humble people, um, but they um, they only see it from um, actually, you know, saying we're going to help you. Mm -hmm. So that's a very different aspect. That's to me, that's a very difficult issue. <coughs> saying we're going to help you. We all need help at the end of the day, but how we do it together, yes, you know, it's yes, going to yes. be very important. It's like mutual, probably. Yes, it's like yes, very yeah, mutual. Yeah. Got to be. Yeah. So uh, being part of so many women's and youth programs and seeing and you know, uh, learning and understanding from women's board, uh, where do you see an avenue of women getting stronger? Like, is there anything current that you see where uh, this collaboration with See, as I said, uh, right now I don't see any such moment which is like having a very strong impact on people, you know, having a lot of collaborations together. Somewhere there is a gap. So this gap has to be built right now from all aspects. Like when I see JNU elections, some failure is there. 
when we see uh, the left and uh, you know ambedkar right moment uh, in india there is a gap <clears throat> so if and only we can understand how what exactly solidarity means mm. solidarity is different from you know uh, taking charge of something mm. so when we know this difference only then we can you know see a successful moment and that is like a, not there in any moment i can say that right at this moment except for those moments which are really autonomous like i would say dalit mahila swabhimani yatra is completely led by dalit women so there is an autonomous body uh, autonomy in that moment so that's going on okay it has gone it has come here even and then we had lot of collaboration from other movements like black lives matter mm -hmm. say hani mm -hmm. and even sasi and lot of uh, you know south asian uh, i think solidarity initiative and we had other uh, friends even bichu was there so we were all there and it was successful of course so we really need to understand where we need to uh, you know build that gap and then uh, or maybe fix that gap yeah okay is this the last um, question or do we have any no no actually we have until 8:15 oh really i thought it was in 7:30 <laughs> no 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 please okay yeah okay 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 take us out right no 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 right right yes i'm an eight hour live streaming available i mean the other thing you know this question of movement movements only come certain time it's not that movement is it's not always there i mean we're going through that phase of not having a movement and that's sort of almost yeah, there is no consistent moment it's yeah, actually it's, emerging out when something happens as a reactive you and, know what i mean to me it's always like um, okay the movement is not here but you can prepare the preparation is what you're doing mm -hmm. is really important because when things do build up then you are already organized yeah so i think you know to me and that's the hardest work because what happens is that when there is no movement organizations have a much tougher time because it's some you know you don't have that gust mm -hmm. of spirit where it takes you forward so it's a really but it's really important to do that work now you know so i think you know that's uh, uh, thank you for raising that because uh, we are actually uh, we have noticed that this particular vacuum is there in uh, indian context where mm. uh, dalit student movement you know is like not connected in a proper way like uh, students from jnu would not know what kind of student body is ex existing in kerala or mm. tamil nadu because there is no specific like for example all the left parties have their mother you know uh, organizations <laughs> and they yeah. they connect them with yeah. some conferences at the national level or, or you know any kind of student conventions and uh, various programs you know they they do it everywhere but then we are not connected anywhere like that because especially the bsp doesn't have a student wing right now and uh, now it is the time for all the student bodies across the country in all the universities mm. to start it's it's basically not a reactive mode but then to build slowly you know to see this movement goes on for a longer time because now we see that justice for rohit pemula justice for delta and justice for jisha is not talked about in yeah not so even in social media it's like completely yeah. you know yeah. silence so this has to go on this has to go on we don't need to remind people okay come back to jisha come back to rohit come back to delta no that is true we need to have a proper movement that needs to be built right now So I, when I look at the uh, Dalit leadership uh, in Indian Panchayat, I see like different strands, strands like one kind of a splinter group, for example, RPI in Maharashtra mm -hmm. and Arthalay and other people. The other strand is the new uh, segment which RSS has managed to form, uh, people like Kudit Raj, uh, Ramulas Paswan has a different history, and that kind of thing. And then on the other the other side completely, there are people uh, like Chandra Mansar, uh, very prominent mm -hmm. Dalit intellectual. Has gone into the direction of the capitalism. Capitalism, now. yeah. Yeah, and so how do they relate? To, have you guys ever like have you had any discussion with these people? Have reached out to what is especially I'm interested in. Um, I would among these people, I think Udit Raj and uh, Chandran Prasad uh, would be more. They have an intellectual leaning, kind of uh, to have this kind of theoretical discourse. What do they think about the issue of 
bringing uh, Dalit women in the leadership roles. Okay. Udit Raj has been trying to bring in Dalit women leadership for a long time. <coughs> it was not for uh, for building up a Dalit women movement, but then to create someone against Mayavati actually. So that's that that's very you know unhealthy discourse. So nobody wants to involve in that. And uh, JNU students initially, when Udit Raj was not with BJP and was with BSP, and uh, at that time people would engage with him. He was never with BSP. So was he was BSP. supporting uh, different no, things no, no. at he that time, and then he was always <laughs> against Maya. That's how so his, his political career was built on that. Yeah. yeah. So started. we were never engaging with yeah. him except when uh, there was a call for reservation, you know, protest for reservation. Otherwise, it's not any kind of ideological, you know, bonding. We never had that with Udit Raj. Atavle, of course, no, not at all. And um, who else? Chandrabhan Prasad is also from JNU, I believe. So okay. I don't know exactly, but then we have never had any. Uh, um, conversation or discussion with him regarding any of these issues especially women no way Dickie is like yeah. recognized by a lot of people like yeah so, yeah yeah uh, we have seen that yeah so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right yeah. um are you sort of uh, you know you're building on the history of um, a little what is over centuries happened. we yeah. have created a timeline actually yeah. Dalit uh -huh. history month uh -huh. which has uh, various you know leaders uh, history about various Dalit leaders women leaders and their you know role in this moment and no, I mean, that is one thing but you know like um, at one level all women are subordinate to um, patriarchy and to subordinate to men and um, sort of, you know, connecting that becomes really important. What is that? You know? Okay, so uh, right now our moment is like, you know, in the initial stages, only fighting against the violence, you mm -hmm. know, uh, caste-based sexual violence, especially. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, it has a long way to go, actually. Yes. Thanks for speaking to us. And sorry, I was late. I, no, I didn't okay. realize. Uh, <laughs> yeah. for some I know the I weather was, was also not. But we were already talking, so I apologize for that. No, no, that's okay. I got something mixed yeah. up. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that, that was a uh, prefix to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so thanks for speaking to us. I think you uh, spoke about a really important topic. Uh, as a man, I too am implicated in this kind of thing uh, because. I, I find a tendency both in myself and other men. It, may, it could be different groups depending on who you are. It could be a dominant man, woman, it could be a dominant man, uh, it could be several things. But this desire somehow to speak on behalf of somebody else is such a, mm -hmm. such a deep, uh, deeply seated tendency. Uh, and so if somebody is telling a story, right, it's, it's so easy for me to just take that story and present it, you know, and I'm thinking that I'm helping somebody else, really, I, I'm so convinced that I'm doing that, uh, but really I'm only helping myself, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you presented such an important uh, topic for our uh, collective thinking, uh, so I just wanted to thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, if you have seen any good examples in which you find either Dalit men or dominant caste women playing the role of a catalyst, where they're amplifying the voices that are already present, but not not grabbing the microphone, but rather holding the microphone to somebody else. That kind of role. Have you seen that? If you uh, had asked this question to Manisha, no? <laughs> she would have come up with a very good example. Right now. Okay, but I don't want to tell her example. But yeah, uh, there are examples definitely. Yes, it, I wouldn't uh, deny that. Okay, there are men, uh, Dalit men, who have been part of the Dalit Mahila Swabhiman Yatra. Even in Bihar, Bihar, it is like we have a group of like five, six uh, Dalits, where majority of them are women and the two men. So these two men would actually help the women to, you know, not only women, but then the whole team to do the work and, you know,
get access to different uh, resources at point, you know, sometimes. But then they don't take the leadership unless and until we ask them to, you know, okay, come on, we, we need to go now, we need to talk now. Then they would definitely. But usually they are there with us. But at, in this whole yatra, I would say that there was not even a single upper caste woman who came forward to show solidarity. That was very, very, very strange, mm -hmm. actually. But when we we were planning to come to North American uh, tour, planning for this, then there were some upper caste women here because probably they have got a different exposure in uh, after coming to US. Probably they had their, as you said, you know, they extended their solidarity and acted like a catalyst <coughs> rather than you know taking our mics and talking on behalf of us. But. I would like to quote Manisha's example now. I remember she was talking, I mean, I was there in that whole yatra, so I know exactly what had happened. In this particular Una case, okay, um, she was, you know, marching with along with other <coughs> men. And uh, whenever they went to villages, you know, there were local women who would gather, but then they would not travel to other places. Uh, there were some upper caste women in that group. And uh, when Manisha started speaking, you know, about why our moments need women's voices from the grassroots level, especially from Dalit women's, because uh, this Chalo Una is about the violence against Dalits. Mm. So she, <clears throat> she was, uh, you know, uh, requesting other Dalit women to come forward and talk. And then suddenly she finds a woman who is like in the leadership position there. She grabs her mic and then she says, this is not Haryana's fight. This is Gujarat's fight. Okay. Thank you for your presence here. And then she goes up. And Manisha was like, what is this? Our fight is fight across the country. It's not just fight for Una, fight for Delta, fight for just uh, Jisha. Dalits are facing the similar problem everywhere. After Una case in Amlapuram, they had two men who were beaten up similarly, you know, for skinning a dead cow. But there was no movement that emerged there. But then recently they had some small talk and then, you know, called Radhika Made. But then this is not a, a moment of one particular place or one particular community over there. It's of all the Dalit community. So this is where I would say that, you know, we need to understand what exactly the community is fighting for. The moment is all about. Without that, you cannot show solidarity. Solidarity doesn't come with this, you know, that, okay, I'm going to be with you all the time. Mm. No, we don't want you all the time, actually, <laughs> because that is going to be like, you know. <laughs> okay, whatever. So, yeah, there are times, of course, when people have taken mics from our hands because they wanted that, uh, you know, power, because that power uh, thing goes on everywhere. The Brahminical structure is mm. very hard to, you know, uh, abolish. Even from our minds. Well, it's become very natural. Yeah. It's become nature. But then we are getting support unconsciously or co consciously. Some people tend to behave like this. But then it's a challenge for them and challenge for us as well. You were saying something. Yeah, yes. I, think, uh, I have a couple of questions. See what issue? Issue. Tackle that. So, it has to be taken up with all conscious people who are fighting for the rights and all that. It's a question of the rights for all. So, basically, so coming to more uh, sort of pragmatic issues, uh, like the three, four states are going to go to elections. Is there any strategy because elections are high time? <laughs> <laughs> to mobilize people, like I know in Punjab, like all the political parties have issued Dalit manifestos. Congress has issued a Dalit manifesto, yeah. BJP, Akadli's, Aam Aadmi Party, and now the fourth front, Awaz in Punjab, this also issued. And you know, so then in Karnataka election, the UP and this stuff. Mm -hmm. So is there thinking about using these opportunities to build more solidarity? I don't have any knowledge on this unless Mayavati thinks of something like that because we are not in support of any of these parties, first of all, whether it is Congress or uh, uh, AAP or mm -hmm. BJP or even 
Samajwadi Party, whatever parties, yeah, because yeah. these parties are not for us at all, completely not for us. Uh, for a long time, Mayavadi has been silent. I can yeah. say that. I mean, this is the same. Punjab, they made a deal with Akabis. The Akabis the are paid her two crore rupees for each seat. I don't even know about that. Candidate, so that Congress and our AAP can do like that. So around 100 seats for 200 crores. So that's pretty good cash. <clears throat> so. I don't have any political knowledge, to be frank. I'm so sorry. Mayavati is the only uh, leader who has raised this issue in the parliament, at least, by Ramadan Paswan and everybody has been that whole time. Rohit's issue? Oh. No, I mean, oh, no, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Issue, All these issues actually were raised by her. Exactly. So, I mean, if you just look at, at a very superficial, even at a superficial level, she has been the only person mm -hmm. uh, who has in any way amplified this. I mean, yeah, when I say silent, it's not in these terms, but then yeah. politically, there is a lot of silence. Whether it is you know uh, reaching out to people or you know market you know how to reach even the media doesn't talk about her unless she is making something you know a statement in the parliament otherwise there is nothing about BSP as such yeah but that's very much by yeah by, by so the these incidents have like you know been supported by her that is one thing which uh, right now you know Dalits are looking forward for definitely. Because uh, even in Rohit's case, a lot of people said that they will bring the Rohit Act, right. and, and that is how they yeah, got the yeah. movement, you know, uh, forward. See, but then nobody talked about, about, about it. When political activity is high tech, you know, these are good opportunities to build networks and connections. You know, so we should think about how to use that strategic model. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, are there any efforts going on in India to identify the Dalit leaders, especially Dalit women leaders, who are not affiliated to any political party? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's bring them in one particular beam or something like that. So, is there, there, is, there, is, there are three groups as such, I can say. One is this All India Dalit Mahila Adhikarman. There is Wing uh, India, that is uh, Women in Governance, and then Namsarjan. So these three groups, as far as I know, have been working at grassroots level and then, uh, you know, uh, providing uh, women, young Talib women leadership trainings everywhere in Gujarat, you know, UP, Delhi, everywhere, even in South India. So that is how these women have, like, you know, emerged as leaders. Manisha, she came in, like, you know, 2008, she started with uh, all India Dalit Makhdadi Karmanch as a volunteer. And then uh, at that time, she was just going to her uh, college probably. And then Sushma in Bihar. And now they have got more leaders from Gujarat, Rajasthan, and UP. So they are trying to uh, build this through training programs, actually. And then also identify more women uh, leadership in you know at the grassroots level. But the only thing what I would like to even say is like this grassroots level leadership should not remain at grassroots mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. They should emerge. Yeah. They should yeah. emerge actually. That yeah. is when the yeah. true, you know, a movement can yeah. emerge. So they have to emerge in the van of society. Yeah, yeah. So what are the hardship you even to bring them to emerge or what? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that a lot of grassroots level activists are, uh, you know, uh, being at the grassroots level. I mean, uh, they are, they are, they are being, uh, you know, like a lot of people have come out, and still they have to go back to those grassroots level again to work mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. not everyone is willing to send their daughters. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. very rare, very rare women get this opportunity to come out and then <coughs> go to fields, work there mm -hmm. because you know uh, there are a lot of threats to them a lot of people have been uh, you know um, um, facing the risky situations like they have a cbi inquiry mm -hmm. on them mm -hmm. police is you know uh, having the uh, you know what we say uh, raids in their houses and then some people some perpetrators would okay. chase them when they are like you know, so how many people are ready to do this because they are already at a risk position being at that you know mm -hmm. village where there is no safety <coughs> so the first and foremost thing we need to talk about is safety so even when we are bringing out these leaders young leaders are we really trying to protect them as a movement as a group so unless and until we our zones and safety for these young women leaders 
we cannot bring more of them. So that is where we need to build and build and build. Actually, mm -hmm. it is a process which is like continuously going on. Now, Dalit women fight is like, you know, that's the reason and, you know, trying to <coughs> put their efforts in creating leadership. Mm -hmm. I think when it adds on the safety measure to it, probably it will be more successful. Um, yeah. <coughs> Because that is that is the major thing. Even I am worried about, and a lot of our uh, you know activists are worried about today. Can you say a little bit about the challenges that rural Dalit women face, as opposed to even some of us who you know slightly a bit educated, speak English, um, possibly are not so vulnerable to sexual violence as the can you say a little bit about their challenges and how that affects them also coming on a national or international? Speaking to few of the grassroots level activists in the past, I I, I, I would feel that I come I especially come from a city, but I had been in the uh, you know in the remote area of the city, so I do understand what kind of you know small small risks that we had taken, and I also understand what major risks these uh, you know grassroots level activists are taking few of these uh, challenges are like you know firstly you don't have proper schools no school at all you know in 10 kilometers from your house no school at all even the smallest of smallest primary schools are accessible only you need to go very far and then access them and uh, when we talk about these families they are not economically very affluent let's say not affluent but even mm. not middle class so they can't afford a cycle for the girls mm. so they have to go approach the disease but that that's the reason sometimes i feel you know uh, they are more powerful than the uh, you know um, uh, city girls because mm. they already know how to approach people when to approach you know uh, the authorities so at the age of 12 at the age of 13 itself they know that okay I need help now because I need to go to school and I need a cycle so I need to talk to the district collector. So their struggle starts from there. So they get to learn but then they are struggling. Mm -hmm. Only through this struggle they are getting to learn. So this is one thing. Basic thing is school system. I would definitely say that if today we want to make any change or bring any change in the society, first thing is to build schools. But the BJP government has actually closed some 3,000 yeah. schools yeah. Yeah. immediately after they came into power stating that uh, teachers are less, uh, more than mm. the students. So that's the reason. So if this is the basic thing which is required and that is being you know taken away from them, then it means that they are still going to face more problem actually. And when they come to colleges, of course, uh, caste discrimination is something that they see <coughs> from the school age. Yeah. Because in that small village, you know, you know where, who, so you who lives where yeah. exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. So even I, I remember in recent interview, I said that I lived in a Harijan colony and someone questioned me, why did you use that word? I said, it's not that I wanted to use it, but then I was in a Harijan colony all my, like, you know, till my 15 or 20 years. That was a colony where it was like separate. We had a separate well, we had a separate temple. And then I used to wonder why none of my friends would ever come to my, you know, uh, house. So. I never knew that I was in Harijan colony till I asked this question to my dad. Why is that my friends don't come here? Then he said, this is a colony for us. <coughs> he did not say Harijan colony. I said, colony for us what? Mm. So this is like, you know, you, you get to know that this girl is coming from this part of the village. So she has to be from Dalit. And that is where the teachers also start, you know, humiliating them. Mm -hmm. So from a very young age, that is one thing that they face and after they come to colleges, it's a lot of struggle because in villages you don't find uh, students like, you know, coming to higher education. It's very rare. Even all our grassroots level activists have their, had their education in that local you know, state colleges and uh, universities. And then when they come here, they face problem with the language because all these schools are mostly namesake schools. They don't actually teach you anything. You get degrees after degrees, but then you don't get knowledge about anything. 
so when you come to the uh, you know cities mm. you know that okay even when you speak people make fun of you because your accent is different you you don't speak their language actually so even if you are belonging to a same community still you have to face this problem even in uh, colleges like jnu i mean <coughs> uh, reputed or uh, institutions you still have this discrimination based on language even in ngos you find this mm. because most of the ngos are headed by you know english speaking and then highly well dressed Uh, you know members so if you are not well dressed then that would be a fun you know and then if you don't speak their language that would be fun mm. for them so this is some something that a uh, lot of lot of grassroots level activists are facing and uh, it actually is very discouraging so that is where again we need to understand you know respect each and every person's role in this movement and then give them you know due respect because they are the ones who are actually the fighters and uh, i would say that if we are able to come here and talk it's because of their work oh. there <clears throat> so if we can identify that and speak about it and then also acknowledge it and then also tell them how they are helpful as you said you know we want to help it's not that we are helping them actually they are helping us yeah so this is uh, maybe uh, including a comment uh, thank you so much thank you for raising thank you for what comes out out of this conversation is assertion uh, or i would say self assertion of women is the biggest threat to civilization <laughs> because the structures of civilization mm. are male centered mm. uh, and the way it is reproduced is by reproducing uh, male characters in everyday conversations surrounding so um, and then when we talk about the women self assertion i see it as a magnum project yes. and that is going to uh, <coughs> uh, because mm. coming from this uh, the most one of the most oppressed groups uh structurally uh, is, is is coming and trying to self assert is uh, uh, in this in this present age and to witness this uh, is, is 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 a very uh, is a very reassuring experience for the observers who are here and um, uh, clearly um, the dalit women leadership that i can imagine is an ideal kind of leadership that is not only important for women constituency but also i think it is important for the constituency of every social movement that has to because the most marginalized that brought in the front and the said there will be a different results we, we don't know what the result will be but i am sure it will be very positive result because we don't have an experiences or is the precedence of knowing what the dalit women leadership in a concurrent social justice movement sure so uh, this was a very great talk thank you for bringing this uh, to you. us and to our knowledge and um, we have we should close and see those are tied so i thank you all thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have to stop for a lot of questions.
closet. Oh, we can take a picture, no? Yeah. Where should we put it? You need to learn these organizations. We are trying to take picture there. Because we are light. We can hold it. Yeah, I think we can hold it. Yeah, somebody can hold it. Okay, so I'll stop this.